Good evening, and have you been waiting for me? That's what Catherine Kuhlman would always say when she'd come on the, on the TV. I don't know if any of you older folks remember them. But I remember my mother used to watch Catherine Kuhlman, Rex Humbard, and some of them oldies but goodies back in the day. I remember seeing this strange lady. I actually went to one of her services at Angela's Temple when I was a little boy and got prayed for by her. But... But she'd come on and she'd go, hello, and have you been waiting for me? And some of you young people don't know who Catherine Kuhlman is, but she had a great healing ministry and God used her in a mighty way at a time when women weren't even supposed to get up in pulpits and stuff. So it was pretty awesome, but uh, that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 6, and then we're going to pray. Everybody doing all right with that smoke out there? I kept wondering the last couple of days why I was just going. <sighs> and then I saw on the news that uh, all that smoke from Canada is coming down, gracing us with its uh, holy smoke presence. <laughs> I, was, I was going out there today and I was looking around and I said, I, it's almost like I'm living in L.A. again. Because back when I was younger, I was out there with first and third and fourth stage smog alerts and they'd keep you inside uh, at school and we'd be so bummed out because we couldn't go out there. It was so bad. But as I got older, they started doing better with the pollution out there. But uh, <clears throat> I was blessed because I lived really close to the beach and every day at about one o'clock, an, an onshore breeze would come and it'd blow all that smog back up into Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, you know. <laughs> and so, but for those people that lived in the San Fernando Valley and up by Hollywood, boy, they would be choking and gagging and it was horrible. You'd have super headaches and then you'd get this sore throat that, that would burn when you'd breathe in. It, it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but it was different than like a sore throat that you get when, when you have a cold or something. But, uh, so you can even hear my voice is hoarse. I start thinking about the smog and it just automatically <laughs> starts tightening up. But anyway, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for your, your word that you've given us, Lord. We ask you uh, during this uh, Bible study, this teaching, Lord, to open up our hearts, open up our minds. Give us ears to hear, Lord, and let it uh, be something that, that impacts us and changes us and motivates us, Lord, in this last hour. Because, Lord, we know that uh, the signs of the times are showing us that uh, it's about time for your soon return. And so we ask a blessing upon all your people here in the mighty name of Jesus. If you're in agreement, say amen. And uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Lay not up treasures for yourself upon the earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break in through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How many of you know you can't serve God and mammon? And now you're thinking, oh, is he going to preach on finances? No. Not, but uh, you've heard me preach many times if you've been here where I say, what is the treasure of heaven? Well, the treasure of heaven is the righteous deeds you do on behalf of the kingdom. And, and the treasure of heaven is those people's lives that you touch for eternity. Amen. That's the treasure that's in heaven. And so uh, we do use our treasure on this earth to promote the gospel and to help people that are in need and to, uh, you know, as missionaries, when missionaries go overseas, we, we don't require that, that people help support the missionaries in these places where, you know, people have never heard the gospel. Maybe they're very poor. That's why the church funds missionaries so that they can go over and do things that we really don't want to do or don't have the capacity to do. Amen. And so the treasure of heaven, the true treasure of heaven is the people's lives that you touch and what you do for the kingdom on this earth. And so with that in mind, we're going to read some scriptures and then we're going to get in to, to some things. And um, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can go over there if you will. Second Corinthians chapter 5. 
We're going to start at verse 8 and read a portion of Scripture. Verse 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And by the way, my, my wife's uncle Ed, he came and preached here along with my wife's family a couple years ago. He died and went home to be with the Lord today. He was 93. And so I'm sure he's just like walking through heaven, lifting his hands, praising the Lord, having an awesome time. Amen. But uh, I'm sure his family's sad. We're, I mean, we're going to miss him. My wife went to the last, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it when you get together with everybody? Reunion. reunion, yeah. Family reunion here a month and a half ago. And, and uh, she's really glad they went. And Uncle Ed was there and he said, well, I probably won't be here much longer. So he must have known. And he sang them all a song. And he, he kind of has a voice like Willie Nelson. <laughs> He's an old cowboy, you know, and he's been a preacher for like, I don't know, 67 years or more. Yeah, so he's, he's been, he's serving the Lord for years and years. So he's went home to be with the Lord and I'm happy for him because he had a rare form of, uh, of leukemia and it took him real quick. So praise the Lord that he's there not suffering anymore. Amen. But therefore we're laboring to be well-pleasing to him, whether I say to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that we, you hear the word labor? Doesn't mean sitting around doing nothing, amen? Who do we labor for? We labor for the Lord, amen? Why? Because we're laying up treasure in heaven. So on a daily basis, I mean, you can impact thousands, you can impact hundreds, or you can impact one or two lives. And it's all, it's all on account, your account in heaven as you do it as unto the Lord, amen? And so, uh, he says, whether present or absent, that we may be accepted of him. For we must, listen to this very carefully here. I want you to understand something. There is a great white throne judgment that you're not going to except to be a witness. Okay? That, if, you, if you go to the great white throne uh, any other way than to be a witness of, of what these people are going to receive, that's a bad thing. But you as a Christian will never be at the great white throne on trial if you're in Christ okay so you've had to make Christ the the Lord of your life the Savior of your life repented of your sins and allowed him to come into your heart and do as the Bible says you must be born again where in the spirit amen and so he says for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us might receive the things done in our body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now let me bring this down into a more modern vernacular. In other words, as we walk as Christians through this earth, we've been given a great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. Uh, one translation says, and make disciples of the people. And that's what we are here. We're a disciple training center. We're, we're more of a disciple training center than anything else. At least that's how I look at it and how uh, Pastor Kelly and I fashioned this as we started this ministry, was to teach people how to live and walk by faith. Amen? And so we want to make disciples out of people. Disciples are not just babies. They're disciplined followers. They're growing up in all things unto the Lord. Amen? And the Bible tells us if we're led by the Holy Spirit, we're the sons and daughters of God. And in the Greek, that denotes a mature person who's coming into a... a, a a cognitive understanding of what Jesus has done in their life and what he's called us to do as the body of Christ. Amen? Every one of you that are born again are a part of the family business. Not my family, but the family of God, which is a part of my family. Amen? You're a part of the family business. You may be involved in this part of ministry. You may be behind the scenes. You may be out there on the streets witnessing. You may be living a life exemplary of Christ the best you can in front of your friends and family. But you're in the family business and you're to exemplify Christ in your body. You're to glorify God in your body. Amen? Because your body's not your own. You were bought with a price, the Bible says. So glorify God in your body. Well, we know that's really difficult to do. Come on, somebody raise their hand and say, yeah, I have a struggle. We all do at times. We get better, though, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And as we take in the engrafted word, it saves our soul or our carnal part of our mind and causes it to synergize with that born-again human spirit that wants to do right 
And therefore, we're able to live by faith, walk by faith, and live better and resist the devil and he'll flee from us. So I don't know about you, but over the 48 years I've been serving the Lord, uh, sometimes I've been up here and sometimes I've been down there. But I'm always trying to press forward to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's not something that I stop doing. Yes, sometimes we fall back a little bit because of circumstances of life hitting us. And some of us, you know, we got, we got baggage from the past that we got to deal with. Some of us more than others. And there's times that the devil will trigger us and we act obnoxious and, and uh, we let our emotions get the best of us and act out. Then we repent. Amen. And we don't let the devil of condemnation hold us back and say, well, look what you always do. You always No, we say, shut up in Jesus' name. I've repented. And guess what, devil? I learned a scripture in church called 1 John 1, 9 that sets me free because if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. Okay? That, that is not a scripture to take the grace of God to lasciviousness. What do you mean lasciviousness? To do anything you want to do. To act the fool as a Christian. That's a scripture that, that secures that blood that Jesus set, shed for you. That you can utilize that grace that his blood provided for you when you make mistakes or when you sin. But we're not using that, that, that uh, scripture, so to speak, to sin whenever we want. Christians that are growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord try their best not to sin. Amen? And I believe you're like that. Um, we make mistakes, but you know, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, what's that? We call it the Bema seat. When is that going to happen, Pastor? Well, here pretty soon, and could be uh, on the 15th or the 16th of Rosh Hashanah this year, at September 15 and 16, we're going to have the Feast of Trumpets. And that's a Trump, that Feast of Trumpets is one feast that has not been fulfilled yet. And most of us that are Bible scholars and 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 study uh, eschatology and end time things, we believe that the rapture or the catching away, the gathering together of the saints to meet the Lord in the air is going to happen sometime on one of those Rosh Hashanahs. Feast of Trumpets. Amen. For the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise with the trump and the voice of the archangel. Amen. We always use that when we do uh, the closure for funerals down at the, at the grave site because it's, it's a blessed hope. It's something that we look forward to. And when we're burying one of our loved ones that are in Christ, they're not dead, so to speak. The body is, but their, their spirit has gone to be with Jesus. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we quoted that not too long ago. Uh, but anyway... So we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. The rapture is going to take place and immediately we're going to go up to be with the Lord. Amen. Okay. How all this is going to work, you've got to understand the God of eternity can be talking to you at the same time he's talking to that one. As there, You understand? We're going to go up there and the books are going to be open and we're going to receive a reward from God if, if our reward is pure and if it's remained. So what happens if I don't have any rewards or I've just kind of not done so much? Well, you're going to be saved, the Bible says, so by fire. Well, God is a consuming fire. And he'll burn up your dead works and what's left will be left. But if there's nothing, you're still in heaven. Yes. So the thief on the cross, <clears throat> when he went to paradise, he didn't have any works. He'd done bad stuff. But he, he received Jesus and acknowledged Jesus as his Savior. And that day he was in paradise. Right. Yes. So, you know, I, uh, there's been a couple people that uh, my wife and I have led to the Lord days before they died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't live for the Lord, didn't really know whether they believed in God or not. And when, the, when we went to visit them, we talked with them, and my wife especially, uh, you know, sing, she always goes in there and sings songs to a man. And if that don't melt somebody's heart, they got a real hard heart because the anointing will come in that place. And she's witness to him. I've witnessed to him. And they received the Lord right there on their deathbed and gave their heart, cried it out, the whole thing. Where were they after they died? Did they have to go to limbo or something? Absolutely not. That's not even scriptural. You either go to hell or you go to heaven. To be, and we, paradise is no longer in the bowels of the earth because when Jesus was resurrected, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Well, that means he took all of those in paradise up to heaven. Yes, 
So David and all the paradise in heaven, that it's, it's just an empty place down there. Okay, but before it was the holding place of the righteous dead, those that had put their faith in the laws of Moses and, and in the coming Messiah. So it's not there anymore. It's been transported to heaven. So right now, uh, in the age of grace under Christ, if you die, immediately you go to be with the Lord. You say, how do you know? Because that's what the scripture says. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if you're not in the Lord, then to be absent from the body is to be in hell. That's right. There's only two places you go. And there isn't nobody after you die that can get you out of hell. Right. You, if you die and you go to hell, you're in hell. That's, right. that's, why, that's why you and I as believers, I don't, you know, there's people I do not like. I think they need to be locked up, put in jail. That's my opinion, right? But my heart cannot handle the fact that, that, that they go to hell. You see what I mean? I, I, might li I might not like them, but if I had the opportunity to witness to them and to share Christ with them and lead them to the Lord, I'd be happy as a lark and like them after that. Yeah. Yeah. But I got to love people. Yeah. The love of God is not something that's, that's a natural love. Natural love is birthed off the love of God. But, but God's love is unconditional. Yes. Amen? But there is a conditional uh, that you receive as son Jesus, but he still loves those that don't. I've heard stories about where so-called people have died and come back, but they went and visited hell, and Jesus was down there with them, and he was sad about all of them that were in there. And they're begging him, let me go. And the same thing that was said to, to, to the, what was it, the guy, uh, not Lazarus, but the other dude, the, the rich man, when he went down there, and he was in hell, and that was when paradise was still in the bowels of the earth. And... Uh, he said, uh, Father Abraham, would you just send Lazarus over here to dip his finger in water and touch my scorched up tongue? And he says, no, because there's a great chasm between thee and them. Amen. And, and he said, uh, well, could you send him back and, you know, let him be raised from the dead and go tell my brothers not to come to this horrible place? He says, they got Moses and the prophets. In other words, God's word is out here. And in this life, this is where we've got to deal with eternity right here. Okay, now as believers, we're born again, we're going to heaven. You die right now, before this sermon's over, you're going to heaven. Okay, well there's a rapture of the church coming pretty soon, and all the end time signs are showing that it could be any time. Okay, there's a couple things that might need to happen, but for the most part, uh, the gathering together could happen at any moment. And probably on some feast of trumpets, it's going to take place. Can you say Amen. Say, so how do you know all this stuff if you're new to, to the gospel? Well, 48 years of study and umpteen books will kind of help you understand a lot of things. And good preachers, good teachers, amen. And we have been so blessed in our generation to have so many good teachers. You know, and some of them just went home with the Lord this year. There's been three real major biggies went home. Pat Robertson, Dr. David Jeremiah. Um, who is the other one? Somebody. I can't remember now. That smoke got to my brain. <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute. But, oh, Dr. Stanley, Charles Stanley. Oh, okay. Yeah, and there could be another one go this year. You know, and, and they usually seem to go in threes or fours. And that should tell you something. When the old guys go, thank God that uh, some of the old guys have taught us well and they passed the baton to us, just like I'm passing the baton to some of you younger people. Amen. Amen. So the, 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 the Bema seat's going to happen right after the rapture of the church. So we'll go to the Bema seat and we'll be judged for the works that we did in this body as Christians. Okay? Uh, so there'll be sins of omission, sins of commission that, that we haven't fulfilled right. Uh, but there'll be a lot of things we've done. I, I want, I want to, re there's rewards in heaven. You say, well, I don't care. I just want to slide into home plate uh, by the skin of my feet, you know. Well, that's good if that's all you're going to do. But me, I want, I want, I want to be able to throw a crown down at my Lord's feet. And I believe I'll have one. Hopefully it's bigger than my wedding ring, you know. Anyway, that'll be that little old intercessor as we joke around a lot that nobody ever knows that she's back there in the back praying for the pastors and praying for the people and pastor walks up to the angel to get his crown. The angel hands him a little crown about like that because that's that intercessor. There's other people doing things that some of us that are standing in front of everybody 
have not really done a whole lot because what we've been able to do, it's been generated by the intercessors. So everybody's got a part to play in this family business. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on here. And he says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us would receive the things done in our body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now, we're, we're not to be terrified of the Lord. We're terrified about what the Lord's going to do to those that don't receive Christ. As I just said, I can't stand the thought of anybody going to hell. As much, whether I like them or not in, in the person, but their, their eternal soul burning in hell forever drives me crazy. You say, well, that's a mean God that would do that. You can think what you want, and there's a lot of stuff we could go through. God is not mean. He's a loving God. God is love. Uh, but he also, he also has standards, and he changes not. And the very fact that he sent Jesus Christ shows that John 3.16 is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anybody, I don't care how bad you are, whosoever believes in Jesus as the Messiah, the propitiation for our sins, and receives him into the heart, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. Amen? And so that's the hope we have right there. God is not willing that any perish, but will they? Yes, if they reject Christ, they will. There's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. I think it says in Acts chapter 4. Hallelujah. Okay. I'm preaching the gospel here, but we're going to get somewhere. Just hang in there with me. You know, sometimes when, when the pastor starts preaching basic stuff, there's a reason for that. Okay. Do you understand? It may not be relevant because you all know it all, but, but it's relevant for somebody, either out there or in here, who knows, okay? So we just flow with the Holy Spirit the best we can. And knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Now, verse 12, for we, com we commend, and Paul's talking about himself and other uh, teachers of the word, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you an occasion to glory on our behalf. In other words, I'm not going to commend myself to you, but you should glory on our behalf for what this ministry here at Victorious Life Church has been able to accomplish over the last 35 years in VBS and people that have come and gone, got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We glory in that fact. And in other churches that some of us have been a part of, people have gotten saved. And our tithes and our offering, our, present, our, our presence, our encouragement has helped the, the, the whole machine, if you will, of that church to bring people into glory. Amen? And so that's what Paul's talking about is the ministry. It's not that he wants attention on himself, but he wants people to understand that the ministry that God has given him has been effectual. Does it make sense? All right, let's, let's, <clears throat> let's see how much more I want to do in this one. All right, I'm going to stop here in this, this scripture. Remember, the, the, so after the, the Bema seat, and we all get our rewards and cry, you know, there's going to be tears. People go, there's no tears in heaven. You need to read the book. It stops the tears at the end of Revelation. But when you get in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he shows you your life as it was, and he shows you what it could have been, sins of omission, commission, you're going to cry your eyeballs out. And you're going to lay at the, the master's feet and weep for a minute. And then he's going to pick you up and he's going to say, but you know what? You accepted me as your personal Lord and Savior. And you're here now with me. All is forgiven. All is justified. Enter into the glory and the joy that I've set before you, that me and my Father put before you. So it'll all be good. But you're going to have to give an account of that. Now, if you have works that, uh, that, that remain, that are, that are works that, that the Lord commends, you're going to receive rewards. He said, well, I don't care. About, well, you will when you get to heaven. You'll want to throw something at the master's feet. And you're going to walk through heaven for eternity talking to billions of Christians throughout the ages. And they're going to ask you, what did you do? And you're going to say, well, I, I was born in the 20th and 21st century. And we had cars, trains, planes, you know. Uh, rocket ships and all that, and they're going to go, wow, I bet you really just evangelized the whole known world of your day. And you're going to go, well, I got a couple people saved. <laughs> and Paul's going to be back there, and he's going to go, what? I had a donkey and a wooden ship and feet. 
And I got all of the Mediterraneans. I planted umpteen churches all throughout Asia Minor and up there in Italy and Sicily and, you know, Macedonia. Man, I don't know. They, they, they're not going to put you down. But I'm just saying for, for the sake of this, this uh, sermon tonight, think about that. Think about what we have. Yes. My goodness gracious. Even people on this dumb Internet stuff is reaching people for Jesus Christ. And you think, you know, sometimes, you know, because we look at the negative media, we don't really know all the good that's being done throughout the earth. Right. You know what I mean? They portray one little segment of, of, of people and, and society as if it's half the world. You know, even when they're showing all the little riots and stuff, there's like a thousand people out there rioting, but there's millions of them that are at home. You know what I mean? But we look at it and we think, oh, the whole world is disintegrating. Well, I don't believe that's completely true. I mean, yeah, we're headed for something. But there's still a, there's still a lot of us believers on the planet. And because of that, we are a restraining force with the Holy Spirit uh, holding back the Antichrist. Yep, I mean, it's all in place, but it can't come on the scene till we're out of here. So after that, we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then the second part of the, of the second coming of Jesus, where he comes and he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, will happen after the marriage supper. Amen. And Revelation chapter 19 talks about all of us and the Lord and a bunch of angels coming back to the earth to set up his millennial kingdom. Glory to God. But before that, let me give you this. All right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For there is no other foundation, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, For no other foundation can a man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, verse 13, Every man's work will be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. That's at the Bema seat, because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Now you're thinking fires of hell. You're thinking fires, you know, in Maui or up in Canada. It's not that kind of fire. It's the consuming fire of the Lord. It's the kind of fire that will consume the dead works, but it won't consume you. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And, and you can say, well, this is a metaphor, yada, yada. It's in, think however you want, but it's still portraying that there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ here. So I'm saved. I'm going to heaven, but my works are going to be judged. Okay. And I'll get a reward or I'll, I'll suffer a loss. For instance, I could, I could be a pastor of a church for 35 years and gripe and complain about my pastorate, gripe and complain about all the people, gripe and complain about this, and, oh, well, God should have made my, my ministry be worldwide, and all this. No, I never wanted that. But, you know, I could do all that, and in all that griping, still do, do good, good things, you know. I mean, giving lip service, get to heaven, and you're thinking, oh, now, I should have a lot because, you know, thousands of people got saved under my ministry. Yeah, well, you know what? You killed your reward by talking smack about it all the time. Oh, amen. amen? And, you know, it's a precious thing that God has given us to, to be a part of the family business and to go out and reach people for Jesus Christ, individually or on a, on a large scale. But whatever we do in thought, word, or deed, we do it to the glory of God and for the kingdom of God, not for ourselves. I mean, it's good to get a pat on the back. Oh, that's a nice sermon, pastor or sister or brother, you know, whatever. That's cool. But you know what? That is not why we do what we do. We do it because we love the Lord and he loves people. And because he loves people, I even love people I don't like. <laughs> I can I cannot like you, but still love you that's right. Amen. with the love of God. Right. I just say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, it does to me because I've served a lot of people I didn't really like personally. But I loved them, and then I learned to like them. Can you say amen? God can make you fall in love with anybody. You know, there's times where you'll, be, you'll have this harshness about you, but then God's love will come upon you, and you'll look at that, that person, and you'll see the potential because God will be showing it to you. You understand? 
That's why people can minister to unlovely people that maybe you can't minister to. Because he put, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost on that one. Maybe it's just the air conditioning. I don't know. But I think it's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be too facetious. But, you know, we got to have a little bit of fun. All right. So every man's work will be manifested. Amen. You know, there's no other foundation than you can lay than that which, which was laid by the apostles, prophets, and, and, and uh, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. I was thinking about this with pastor's message about the church. And, you know... The apostles and the prophets and the, you know, the believers of the early days, they laid a foundation for us. And church was a part of that. Fellowship was a part of that. How dare us try to change and convert what, what they laid with Jesus being the, the chief cornerstone. You know, Jesus is coming after a body of people. He's not coming for this building. He's coming for us. But it's a collective body and we're better together. All right. Well, I hope we are anyway. We are in this church right now. So, all right. Um, go ahead and look over at Revelation chapter 4. And then we're going to start blasting through here. We're going to try. Is this all right? All right. Revelation 4.10. Let's just kind of look at, this is after John has went up. Come up hither, John, in the book of Revelation. And most of us believe that this is kind of a prelude to the rapture of the church. And obviously the church is not mentioned after chapter 4 because they're all in heaven with the four and twenty elders praising the Lord. And it says, Revelation 4.10, The four and twenty elders fall down uh, before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever. And you should go back and read this all in context too who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So we're going to talk about some crowns here. Turn over real quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And if you can't turn there quick enough, I'm going to just move through it anyway. And you can always go back and get this on our, our church app because they're all uploaded at least a, a couple of days before or a couple of days after they're preached. You with me? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Paul is saying, uh, he's looking for the Lord's return. He says, for now I'm ready to be offered up. So he's ran his race. He's finished his course. He knows that death is awaiting him. Paul, by the way, got beheaded in Rome. And it wasn't too long after Paul got beheaded that Peter was hung upside down on the cross. These two martyrs. Okay? And so he says, For I'm now ready to be offered up, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. This is how Uncle Ed was, was speaking at the last uh, family reunion. He's saying, you know, I've ran my race. I've finished my course. I won't be here with you next year. But but I'm going to go be with my Lord in glory, amen, and all his family members that, are, that have passed before him. He's ready to go. He knew he was going to go. Amen. Everybody else was going, no, Uncle Ed, you're going to stay. But he knew he was, his time was at hand. And you know what? That's a great thing. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, when Jacob died, he, ga he prophesied over his grandchildren. He gathered up his feet, and he gave up the ghost. He did it on his, on his dime. Amen. Uh, you get out there and you get to be as old as Uncle Ed or, or old Jacob and you've ran your race and God's done with you and it's time for you to come home and be with Him. Just gather up your legs and go to, go to sleep in Jesus. Right. Don't necessarily have to die of a dreaded disease, but, you know, however I get there, I don't care. I just want to get there. Amen? I'd like to just fall asleep. How about you? Amen. Or I'd like to go in the rapture. That's what I'm believing for. I keep telling Mom, Mom, hang on. Don't, don't, don't leave a stick. Stay down here and we'll all go in the rapture together. My mom's going to be 93, by the way, uh, this Saturday. is her birthday. 93 years old. Can you imagine? And she cooked dinner for us tonight. <laughs> Cleaned her house, too, this week. Vacuumed it and did all that. I don't, my mom's a piece of cake right now. She, she takes care of herself. She takes care of us. You know, I think sometimes older people that are in fairly good health, that's one of the things that keeps them alive. 
They want to take care of their family. They want to, they want to be useful. Yes. Amen. So we let her be useful. Her burritos are pretty good. <laughs> Especially since I didn't have to make it. All right. So he says, uh, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, out hereafter, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. But listen to this. Not only me, but unto all of those that love his appearing. How many of you are looking for the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm looking up every day. I'm like, God, when are you coming back? When is Jesus going to come and get me? I, you know what? I like certain aspects of my life in this world, but in my heart, because I understand the scriptures, there's nothing better than going to heaven. I'm telling you, you, you know, I've gone camping and been all over parts of the world and, and the United States and so have some of you. And, and I've seen some beautiful waterfalls and, you know, backcountry and things. But none of it's going to compare to what's in heaven. None of it's going to compare to the new heaven and the new earth when Jerusalem is transferred to this earth. New Jerusalem is transferred to this earth in the new kingdom. Woo! You won't even need the sun to, to bring light because the glory of God's going to, going to light the world. Amen? You say, well, this all seems like a sign. That's the problem. We watch too many science fiction and fairy tale shows that sometimes this astounding, miraculous thing that the Bible talks about almost seems like a fairy tale. But to some of us, it's become a reality. Some of us have been blessed to get a glimpse of the other side. And, and some of us have had our hearts opened up and our eyes opened up spiritually to see what the Word of God says. And we believe it. I hear these kids all the time go, well, show me a miracle or tell me, tell me something or, you know, prove that Jesus was real. I can't prove anything. I mean, even if I did a miracle, when Jesus walked this, this earth, he did miracles left and right, and they still said he did it by the devil. And you even got preachers out there saying that preachers that do miracles and operate in the Spirit are, are being used by the devil. It's crazy. And they tell you, oh, we're, we're Bible-based people, but they don't believe the gospel. They don't believe the truth of God's Word. Like I said the other the last Sunday, I said I listened to one, and he says, "Well, there was given three offices to the church: the evangelist, pastor, and teacher." Well, yeah, those were three, but there's two more: apostles and prophets. Oh, they died in Jesus' day. No, the original twelve apostles died, but there are still some apostles today. I apostled this church with Pastor Kelly and my wife. Am I apostle? I don't think I'm an apostle. I know I'm prophetic. Okay, but I was a pastor. More than anything, you see. So we can flow in different offices and so forth. But what does an apostle do? He's a sent one. I was sent from California back here to start a church with me and my brother and my wife. Right. Amen. Amen? Amen. And for that period of time, him and I together and my wife and those that came alongside us, Patty and Al and different ones, we functioned apostolically and, and started Victorious Life Church here. Okay, so are you a great apostle? No, I don't claim any of that. I'm just saying we have to understand the definition of the type of apostles there are now. They start works, they oversee works, and they release works to the, to the, the pastors and the teachers. Amen? And they usually work with a prophet. Yes, amen. And that's how it works. It's biblical. And you're going to go, well, I'm going to change the word of God to fit my, my mentality and my, uh, you know, the way I see things. Well, no. I'm the Lord God, the Bible says. God is, God is God and He changes not. If He did it back then, we need it now. If we needed miracles back then, we need them now. Because we're fighting a supernatural enemy right now and we need the eyes of our understanding being open and we need the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost in the church today and outside the church. So a crown of righteousness, number one, if you love the appearing of the Lord. Number two, you can go over to Revelation 2.10 if you can get there quick enough. Crown of righteousness. Number two, a crown of life for those who have withstood trials, tribulations, and mar even martyrdom. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear not of those things which you will suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribu tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now that's a martyr's crown. 
Uh, how many of you want a martyr's crown? <laughs> I want to die, like Jesus says, take up my cross daily and die without dying. Okay? But the martyr's crown is specifically given to these folks like Paul and Peter and modern day uh, missionaries that have gone in hard places to preach the gospel and ended up giving their lives for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll be good without that crown if I can keep from it. Amen. But it's, it's, those people get a better resurrection. Now, I don't know what that all means. But that must mean they're going to get accolades from the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father himself. Amen? Amen. That little girl at Columbine that they shot in the face when, when the guy asked her to renounce Christ, she said, hey, no. She was just a high school student. She's got a martyr's crown. Amen? Um, like I said, God bless those people that got guts to do that, that were thrown in the arena, eaten by lions, uh, dipped in tar and burned uh, with fire. I mean, I'm not one of those that's going to the lion easy. Just saying. But they did. Maybe they had no choice. Uh, but I'm just saying. Because if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So I think dying by the sword is better than getting eaten by a lion. For me, personally. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but you never know what, what awaits you. And you never know what kind of courage you've got to have. Because we are coming for persecution right now. There are people in Europe and stuff that are going to prison right now for just praying silently at abortion clinics. Well, it won't happen here. Well, it's happening in Canada. And I just saw a YouTube video where they took a boy at a, at a, um, a transvestite, whatever they call that stuff. Uh, and he, didn't, he wasn't even speaking things negatory. He was just... He was just reading the Word of God. And the cops came and took this young boy. He was only in his teens and handcuffed him and threw him in jail. While they're out there doing their dancing around with their little cootie booties and all that stuff, acting crazy and, and bizarre and perverse. Like right now, if I was in Europe, they'd be coming and visiting me at my house for saying what I'm saying right now on the Internet. You know, they want to shut us up. But you know what? We got, a, we got a window of opportunity and grace to pray and to stand up for righteousness right now because if we don't, there's going to be many people that's going to be taken in, in lines and they're going, to, they're going to have a choice to renounce and go to a re-education camp, which they want to send Jordan Peterson. He just got saved not too long ago. He still needs to get rid of his intellectualism, but he got saved and they're thinking about sending him to a re-education camp. Can you believe that? One of the most intelligent psychologists and sociologists of our day, because, he, because he's standing against tyranny, they want to they re-educate him and, or else take his license away that he worked so hard for. This is the kind of society we're coming into. And we still got a little bit of time to fight this thing. Okay? Uh, so let's stand up for Jesus while we can. Amen? Because night's coming when no man can work. So work while it's day. Crown of life for those that withstood trials and tribulation and martyrdom. All right, number three, the crown of glory given to pastors and elders of the fivefold ministry. 1 Peter 5 1 says, The elders which are among you, I exhort who I am also an elder and a, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly and not for filthy money. But, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, that means being tyrants. There's a lot of tyrant pastors throughout history. But being examples to the flock. And that's where a lot of pastors and leaders in the body of Christ need to come back to. You're not out there for us. We're up here for you. We are a gift that is broken and spilled out for you. You're not a gift to us. Amen. But we're here as shepherds, as regents under Christ to bring people into a knowledge of the truth and to help them and guide them and, and to be there and set an example. Amen? Amen. And, and let me say this. This goes for Sunday school teachers. It goes for women's ministers. It goes for people that, that are even intercessors that have been given that place of authority in the church by the pastors. Do you understand? This is, this is a crown that... because. 
I'll tell you what, Mary, you're a pastor here too, whether you got the title or not. You should have it, but you, you don't have it so-called title. But you pastored women all for the last 32 years that I know of, you and Kim and my sister back here who was the best intercessor, prayer, prayer leader we've ever had in this church. Sister Penny, some of you don't even know about all the stuff she prayed and the things that her ministry in this church uh, has done. Amen. I'm just saying, people that shepherd the flock or help the shepherd shepherd the flock and take care. Because you know what? One man, one woman can't do it all. Okay? So I'm just saying there's a crown of life for those uh, that uh, are pastors and elders in the fivefold ministry. Elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. So take it serious. Yeah. Amen? And, and those of you that are not so called in the fivefold, you still have a part to play in this, whether you get a crown exactly for this or not. Amen? Now, number four, I'm going to give you another one. You ready? Number four, you can go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. So every one of us can potentially have at least two crowns, some of us three. There's a couple crowns that are reserved for certain people, but every one of us as Christians, so I, I'm, I'm claiming, um, I'm not claiming the martyr's crown. <laughs> I'm claiming that uh, crown of righteousness, which all of you should claim. I'm claiming the, the crown of glory because I'm a pastor. I'm claiming this crown right here because I, I started off before I ever thought of ever being a minister. This was, my, this was my juice right here. This was what I did when I first got saved. I mean, the first week I was saved, I was doing this. New two scriptures by heart. Okay, The crown of rejoicing given for soul winning, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye... In the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at His coming, for you are a crown of, uh, of glory and joy. So, when when Jesus comes, all the people that I've ministered to, and especially those that I've led to the Lord, I've uh, got filled with the Holy Spirit. Those people that I've soul wind, and I've led a lot of people to the Lord over the years. Amen. <laughs> They're my crown of rejoicing. So I know I'm getting three. I don't know how big they'll be, but I'm getting three, and I don't care how big they are. I just want one to do like the four and 20 elders to throw at their feet. We're almost done. You with me? We're not, we're not saved by our own works, but we're, we're saved uh, by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8. Not, not of ourselves. So once you're in Christ, why do works if you're saved by grace and you don't, have, you don't earn anything else? You've already gotten everything you're going to get. Well, it's because we love the Lord. And because as born-again people, there's an unction on the inside of us by the Holy Spirit to live righteously and to do good works. Amen. Yes, amen. Come on. I want to do better every day. How about you? Yes, amen. Because I'm going, to, I'm going to stand before my Lord. And I, I thank God. Listen, here, here's something for you. I thank God that anything that I put under the blood with 1 John 1, 9, anything I put under the blood from my past, and believe you me, I've got things to be ashamed of in my past, as many of you do too, okay? Uh, so all of that stuff from the past, kids, children, behave. All that stuff I did, did in the past is under the blood. So the devil brings up this stuff to me. I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I, especially as I've gotten older and I've said this before, some of that past stuff that I did comes up and I, you know, I never really thought a whole lot about who I hurt or what went on. But, you know, as you get older, you begin to go, you know what, I, I never did really uh, consciously really think these things out. I just kind of put them on the back burner. So some people go, well, you shouldn't do that. I get that, but some of us, we have to rectify. We have to, we have to reconcile that to ourselves, even though God's forgiven me. So God's not going to, when I get the, the Bema seat, God's not going to go, hey, you remember what you did before you got saved? You remember what you did last week that you put under the blood and you asked for forgiveness for? It's really, it's really going to be a, a judgment of your works as far as the Great Commission goes, of leading people to Christ and and you know, representing Jesus down here on this earth. It's going to be more about that than, oh, I thought this bad thought or I said this wrong word or 
You know what I mean? Now, the Bible does say every idle word that a man speaks, he'll give an account of on the day of judgment. So there's some of that stuff you got to watch out for too. But, you know, the things you put under the blood. Amen? I think a lot of that scripture pertains to right here and now. Every idle word you speak, you better be careful to quickly cast it down and ask for forgiveness or, or take it back because the enemy's standing around listening to you. Your holy angels are standing there listening to you. I can't quote the scripture verbatim from Ecclesiastes, but it says, don't say before your angel it was an error. <laughs> so your angel don't like it when you say stupid things too, right? We all need to get better at it. And I'm glad God gave me a good wife and a mother that straightens me out. Now even my daughters are doing it. All right, our last one here, but it doesn't mean we're going to close yet. We're close. We're close. Okay, number five is the incorruptible crown that, that's given to those that overcome daily temptations and struggles of life. So here's another one that every one of us can get. So there's two or three crowns that just regular believers can get. You see, the martyr and the pastor one is reserved for certain people. But I'll tell you what, three crowns is better than none, <laughs> isn't it? And you can get this one. What is it? You're resisting sin. You're trying your best to follow the Holy Spirit in everyday life. Every day you're doing like Paul in Philippians chapter 3 where he's pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Jesus Christ. To have an out-resurrection. What was he talking about in the Greek? It talks about an out-resurrection in that, in that passage of Scripture. It means without dying. To have, if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He'll make alive your mortal body. He'll empower you for works of service and to live a life exemplary of Jesus Christ. To overcome sin. To resist the devil. Come on. How many of you have broken habits in your life? I don't talk exactly the way I did before I met Jesus. I don't think the way I thought before I met Jesus. There's a few dumb things that come in my head, but you know what? He's given me a recipe for that. He says that I'm to cast down imagination and every high thought or lofty thought that would exalt itself against the true knowledge of God. That's the weapons of my warfare. They're not carnal. They're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. How do I do that? With the Word of God. When a dumb thing comes into my head, I have the, I have the opportunity. I'm not having sinned yet. You know what I mean? The devil can put a thought in your mind. Your old man can bring up a thought. But you have the right to cast it down before it becomes sin. When, when you start meditating on it and then you act it out, that's when sin is conceived. Amen? Through the lust of your flesh. And that's not all about sexual sin. There's a lot of different types of lusts. There's a lust that we're, we're told to have. We're, we're to covet earnestly the best gifts. So that's an okay lust. But other lusts, not so much. <laughs> so this fifth crown is the crown incorruptible given to those who overcome daily struggles in life. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Know ye not, what did Paul say? He said, I've ran my race. I've finished my course. Okay, know ye not, that they which run in a race run all, but, all, but one receiveth a prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for master, mastery is temperate in all things. That means he, he keeps his body in check. He buffets his, buff, not, not buff, buffets his body, not buffets it. <laughs> right? Some of us have buffeted a little too much. <laughs> And every man that strives for mastery or wants to walk in a, in, a, in a mature way before the Lord, being led by the Holy Spirit, who's learned how to, to discipline and bridle his body. Paul said, I beat my body. Well, I don't say that you should flagellate yourself, but I guess Paul wanted to do it. I don't know what he did. You know, you see these guys in other cultures going, beating their backs till they're bloody. So they go through the ritual. Everybody sees, oh, look at these righteous men. Two weeks later, they're with a prostitute or something. I mean, you know, that's not how we do it. We, we, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in us, and by the Word of God that renews our mind, we tell our body no. Amen? Treat your body like a little kid. No. 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 Nuh-uh. Uh-uh. No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. no. That word should be used more on yourself than on a little kid. I really don't like it when everybody, no, no. 
kids, you keep doing, I don't know, you keep doing it to a kid, you just incite that, that rebellion in them, in my opinion. Anyway, so what should I do? I don't know. I'm not here to talk about marriage and family. Talk to Sister Mary back there. She could tell you how to handle little kids. That was her expertise. I'm just an old dad. <laughs> Amen. So every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, you know, there's certain things that really aren't sins, but I can't do them because I have an addictive personality. I mean, I could get addicted to cherries, start eating cherries. I got to get me some cherries, you know, um, burritos. I could eat a burrito every day. I don't know why. I just could. I'd take a while. I could eat a steak every, every day. How many of you could say amen to that? Some of you go, I couldn't even chew it up. But anyway, I like them. I could be addicted to that. You know, I get addicted to just routines. Uh, just saying, you know, we have, to, we have to be tempered in things. There's some things we just don't allow. There's some days that we just need to go, you know what? I'm turning this off. I'm going for a walk without it. I thought about doing that yesterday, but it still went with me. I'm getting there. <laughs> <clears throat> but I was listening to a, a brother preaching the gospel. Sometimes it's good just to walk and just enjoy the bird song and, and the wind. And I know you have to deal with the cars and stuff, but hey, sometimes it's just nice, you know, to go out there and not hear all this stuff or not have kids yelling and screaming. It's just nice. So a crown incorruptible for those that overcome daily temptations. Hallelujah. Last scripture here. Colossians 3.23. Ready? And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive a reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect to persons. Amen? Now, I, I said one last one, but here, here's another one. I have to give you this one, okay? Revelation 3.11, and then we will close with this. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to that which you have, so that no one may take your crown. Love the Lord. Sister Mary, why don't you get up and dismiss us, please? You bestowed upon us not only salvation, Lord, but um, a desire to please you in all that we do. And if that earns a crown, it earns a crown. But, Lord, we're just so grateful to be your servants. And I ask that you bless each and every man and woman, uh, young man, young woman here tonight. Um, give us the opportunity to spread the light uh, that you infuse within us and, and the word uh, of the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. I will be preaching on Sunday morning. Pastor's uh, going to be doing a funeral for his, for his aunt this Saturday. And so be in prayer for the family. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning. Amen. Unless we uh, see each other in the air. Which would be all right with me.